I'm William Henry, and this is Ascension Keepers. About two to three hundred years before the Christian era, a remarkable mystical movement arose. The core ideas of this movement came from Alexandria, Egypt, but it spread to Palestine where these mystics set up shop, so to speak. In Egypt, these mystics were called the Therapeutae, the healers. They were known for their flowing white robes. They established an embassy outside the walls of Alexandria on the shores of Lake Mariatus near Alexandria. In Palestine, they were called Essenes and Nazarites or Nazarenes, meaning watchers, because they were watching for a high celestial being they believed was soon to visit Earth. Although they were primarily but not exclusively Jewish, the Essenes were master weavers of Egyptian, Iranian, Greek, and Tibetan ascension practices. In fact, for three centuries, beginning in 300 BC, the forerunners of this mystic tribe had been following the way of the Magi, researching and merging Babylonian, Egyptian, Iranian, Pythagorean, and Buddhist alchemical philosophies and ascension practices that feature humans opening holes in space and ascending into heaven. In my opinion, they would heavily influence the Essenes and early Christianity. From these teachings, they began writing about translating humans into angels, opening gateways to heaven, and the emergence of a new, improved child of light who would win a war over the sons of darkness and inaugurate a new era of light. calling themselves the perfect ones or the way of perfection or perfect light humans, they seek to lead a revolution in human evolution that would result in the appearance of a new type of human and a different human experience in our world. We will use this word perfect as a sort of a golden needle to weave a thread through various ascension traditions. The word perfect means to become more whole, more holy, more complete, and cosmic. According to mystical Jewish tradition, Adam and Eve, as archetypes of the human race, wore celestial garments of light, which was actually a luminescent body that glows or radiates light like a rainbow. The Essenes believed our purpose and goal in life was to return to our original divine state and recover our garments of light, remembering our light bodies would lead to a transformed world, they believed. Early sources say the Essenes lived on Mount Carmel in northern Israel, but they also operated a hermetically sealed compound at Qumran and elsewhere. Calling themselves the children of light, the Essenes literally saw themselves in a cosmic war against the children of darkness, who they believed were incarnated as the Roman Empire. They claimed they were making the way for the arrival of a high celestial being who would lead a revolution in human evolution, transforming Earth and humanity into a golden planet of righteousness and the human race into its most perfect state of being. Many believe Jesus was this celestial being. Even more incredible is the Essenes' claim that they were living living with an advanced race of angels or extraterrestrials. These angels who took human form were known as the Watchers. They were teaching the Essenes the art of ascension or how to transform our earthly flesh into a celestial flesh and ascend to a celestial city they referred to as Sion or the New Jerusalem. Out to stop all this mystical nonsense are the children of darkness who the Essenes believe were incarnate in the mighty Roman Empire, the reigning cabal on Earth. In my opinion, the accounts of the Essenes' interactions with the Celestials are contained in the Dead Sea Scrolls, the texts they left behind. These extraordinary texts affirm there was something truly unusual and mystically special about the Essenes. They are quintessentially spiritual, oriented towards the celestial realm and its otherworldly inhabitants. Their goal was an alliance with the upper world. The scrolls describe cosmic battles, beings, portals, hidden agendas, and new superhumans. And cloaked behind it all 
is the celestial city, the home and mother church of their angelic teachers and the target of their ascension and how humans can ascend there. The dark side won a major victory in AD 68 when the Romans decimated the Essenes in an early example of ethnic cleansing or spiritual genocide. With the destruction of the Essenes and the murder of almost a million of these souls, their ascension teachings were lost, stashed in caves near Qumran, but they were not forgotten. Mystical luminaries sought their teachings for ages. Believing in reincarnation, it's possible the Essenes knew that their disappearance at the hands of the Romans was a temporary state of affairs. They would return. The Essenes' cache of scrolls, in fact, was rediscovered by chance in 1947. In my view, these texts describe the process by which all the Therapeutae, or members of the Essene community, entered or ascended into the angelic life. The Essenes sought this bodily and spiritual perfection in order to cross over a veil or a boundary then and commune with these beings and to stand united with the angels before God and to live in a state of perfect light for all eternity. One scroll speaks directly of this transformation. And thou hast cleansed the perverse spirit from many sins that he might enter into the station with the army of the saints and enter into communion with the sons of heaven. And thou hast cast an everlasting destiny for man in the company of the spirits of knowledge, that he might praise thy name in concord and recount thy marvels before thy works. In my view, the word sin simply means to miss the mark or to fall short of perfection. It basically means to be embodied in fallen and imperfect human flesh as opposed to our original and perfect glorious light bodies of celestial flesh. The purpose of cleansing or perfecting the spirit and overcoming sin is so that one may better serve God, but ultimately it enables one to enter the heavenly realms and live in communion with the sons of heaven as perfect light beings in the celestial city, according to the Essenes. The Essenes have an aura of profound mystery about them. Writing in the first century AD, the Roman writer Pliny mysteriously claimed that they had existed for thousands of ages, hinting that they are part of a forgotten eternal race that he says exists outside of time. This may be the race later referred to as the immovable race of perfect light humans, or simply as the race in the secret book of John, a Gnostic text of secret teachings. Becoming perfect light humans was clearly the goal of the Essenes. Philo, the famous first century AD Jewish philosopher living in Alexandria, Egypt, also briefly discussed the Essenes in his works, Every Good Man is Free and Hypothetica. Intriguingly, he traced their origins to the time of Moses, the Hebrew Messiah or Magi who emerged as a radiant being after a meeting with God in a burning bush to lead his people to freedom and who supervised the construction or assembly of the Ark of the Covenant. The burning man or angel he encountered was described as luminous, humanoid, and with a rainbow aura, one of many such beings we will encounter in our journey. Says Philo, multitudes of his disciples has the lawgiver trained for the life and fellowship. These people are called Essenes, a name awarded them doubtless in recognition of their holiness. And we have to remember holiness means to be luminous, radiant, and angelic. Others trace the Essenes' origins to Enoch, the incredible pre-flood sage, the first human translated to heaven. During his ascension, the Archangel Michael anointed Enoch's body with an oil that dissolved his body into rainbow-colored light that matched that of the angels. Take note of the rainbow angel connection. It will recur repeatedly and is a key to understanding the Essenes in their quest to become perfect light humans. These statements make it clear that the Essenes were ancient, they knew mystical secrets, and these secrets had to do with human transformation into celestial beings and 
ascension. The purpose of the Qumran community is precisely described in the call of Isaiah, chapter 40, verse 3, to prepare the way for the Messiah in the desert wilderness, to prepare a people to meet the Lord. Simply, the Essenes believed a high celestial being was on its way to earth, and they had a plan to manifest this event. During this visitation, says the community rule, the high heavenly being would reveal the mysteries of eternal being concealed from humankind. At that time, the righteous will be rewarded with healing, great peace, and a long life and fruitfulness together with every everlasting blessing and eternal joy and life without end. A crown of glory and a garment of majesty and unending light, says the community rule. The goal of the Essene initiates was to attain this crown and garment. And actually, they said it's the goal of all humans in all ages. The community rule affirms the Essenes were a most holy community who walk in perfection. Their writings contain their teachings about the perfection of this garment of majesty in unending light, actually an angelic light body composed of celestial flesh as opposed to earthly or human flesh. This is the state of being of the perfect light humans mentioned earlier. In Essene philosophy, the word perfection relates to wholeness, holiness, compassion, and completion in preparation for ascension to a celestial city they called the New Jerusalem. Perfection is synonymous with angelification or angelomorphism as the academics refer to it. This is human transformation into an angel. My research reveals that to link the Essenes' understanding of perfection with the Tibetan Buddhist concept of the great perfection or human transformation into the rainbow light body. Tibetan sacred art portrays this transformation as a flowing, vibrating, pulsating robe of rainbow light enlightened with gold. In my opinion, this is the same as the glory body or resurrection body of Jesus, the high celestial being the Essenes were calling in. What I noticed is that the symbols of the rainbow body gurus, including Padmasambhava, include his crown of glory, the resurrection stick and radiating rainbow light are the same symbols as those of the Israelite high priest. And as we will see, it links these two traditions and tells us there is an esoteric meaning to the Essene teachings. Ascension to the Essenes is a process by which righteous humans are taken to heaven and exist in the presence of God and wear the robe of light. Properly attired, they were now ready to come into the presence of God, and this is what the Essenes termed resurrection. Some maintain that this resurrected state of being only lasted a brief moment. They suggest these initiates and adepts would enter in an, into an otherworldly place and experience a brief trial run encounter with the higher realms and then would come right back into their physical body. Others maintain that the resurrection or ascension and their transformation into an angel was a permanent experience. And before continuing, we need to address a very important question. Why were they called Essenes? Essene, what does the word mean? The answer takes us to the heart of the Essenes' mission. The most favorable definition is the one given by Josephus, a historian who is a one-time Essene but turned into a Roman soldier and servant of the empire. In his Antiquities of the Jews, he gave a description of the vestments worn by the Israelite high priest. Josephus explains that the outer vestment was called the ephod, and part of this vestment, he says, was the esen, a transliteration of the Hebrew word hoshen, meaning breastplate. Hoshen was translated into Greek as esen, which means oracle and breastpiece of judgment. This breastpiece, he says, is the origin of their name. Josephus' description of the esen is alluring. 
It had 12 different colored stones, each of them with the name of one of the 12 tribes of Jacob, who famously ascended on the ladder of heaven in the book of Genesis and returned to earth to found the nation of Israel. These stones were arranged three to a row in four rows. And when the sunlight hit these stones, the high priest would have radiated rainbow light. The ascent also contains an additional two stones referred to as the Urim and Thummim, which means revelation or truth, as well as lights and perfections. Later interpreters derived the word from the root word light and related it to the root be complete, finished, whole, or perfect. The ascent is therefore a key part of the garments the high priest would don before crossing the veil and entering the Holy of Holies of Solomon's temple. This cube-shaped room whose walls were lined with gold was a place where extraordinary things occurred. Mortals entered into this golden cube as humans, stood on the footstool, the Ark of the Covenant, ascended to a place of illumination via this throne were transformed into angels and returned from heaven alive. Scholars led by Dr. Margaret Barker debate whether or not this ascension was a literal experience or simply metaphorical. The garments worn by the high priest were real, but the experience of transformation into light was imagined, some believe. I'm of the view that the ascension was a literal transformation of human flesh into celestial flesh, and that the garments of the high priest were metaphorical, symbolic, or imagined. My research reveals that the components of this garment, the crown, the breastplate, the belt, and sandals, are psycho-spiritual attributes activated in the consciousness of the high priests in preparation for their ascension to higher realms. Here, we see the high priest Zechariah receiving word from the archangel Gabriel that his aged wife will soon have a son, John the Baptist, who many revere as the great Essene master initiator. In his Antiquities of the Jews, Josephus hints at these assumptions about ascension and the Urim and Thummim when he says that on the ascend, also there are stones, 12 in number, of extraordinary size and beauty, an ornament not procurable by man by reason of its surpassing value. Listen to that line again. Not procurable by man by reason of its surpassing value? If a human cannot procure it, who can? How about God and the angels, or humans who are more than human, but in between God and the angels? That's the Essenes. The breastplate of righteousness, the Asen, and the Urim and Thummim stones did not operate on their own. They were part of a kit of tools, devices, or apps, if you will, of the high priest that are further identified by the Apostle Paul in his letters to the officiants, written while he was in prison in Rome in AD 62. In the letter, Paul gives advice on living a holy, pure, and Christ-inspired life. In chapter 4, he tells how to put on the new self, created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Therefore, he says, each of you must put off falsehood and speak truthfully to your neighbor, for we are all members of one body. In your anger, do not sin, he said. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. Anyone who has been stealing must steal no longer, but must work doing something useful with their hands that they may have something to share with those in need. Then, Paul warns of a coming, or is it an ongoing, cosmic battle. In my opinion, this is why Paul is clearly telling the officiants to put on the ascend as a way to overcome the children of darkness. He is clearly urging us to augment or supplement the human body with spiritual tools for a battle against an otherworldly dark force or in order to ascend. I understand this armor to be metaphorical and psycho-spiritual. It comes from within. It's something that we externalize, embody, or exude. As Paul says, the use of this spiritual technology forms a shield of faith 
a suit of cosmic armor or a second skin that seals and protects us and also permits access to realms off limits to humans clothed only in ordinary skin. Scholars have discovered that Paul's letter to the Ephesians reflects Essene texts. They now see that this letter was written for readers with Essene eyes. So it's important to note that Paul is writing to multitudes of people in Ephesus. Josephus records that many of the Essenes had the ability to predict the future. Did they do so because they all were wearing the breastplate? No. Once again, this suggests that more than one person wore this extraordinary ensemble simultaneously. In fact, they implore the entire tribe of Essenes to be holy. By definition, this means to wear the spiritual armor or second skin. In order for this to work, there must have been more than one of these Essene breastplates. But again, the priestly garb would be worn by all. So are we to picture multiple members of the Essene community wearing the 12 stones and other items simultaneously? Or is there another explanation? Indeed, there is. According to Josephus, the Essenes were trained to tell the future, and they were training to become angels or celestial beings. If the breastplate is something activated from within our body, rather than material objects placed upon it, then we would presume that training manuals must exist for putting on the breastplate and the other spiritual tools. In fact, numerous Essene texts are devoted to teachings about how to put on the Essene and how to ascend to the celestial temple. The two go together like a NASA astronaut reading a training manual while putting on a spacesuit in preparation for launch into space. One such text is called Self-Glorification Hymn and tells how a member of the Qumran community ascended to heaven for the purpose of gaining knowledge, took an exalted place on God's throne in the celestial temple, and came back to Earth. In fact, as Princeton scholar Martha Himmelfarb documents, boundary crossing of this nature was becoming common at this time. The Essenes taught that humans who have completed the ascension process, referred to as apotheosis and angelification, can also sit on the throne. Heavenly ascent was all but eliminated in the Bible, which views heaven as God's domain and off limits to humanity without an invitation. The self-glorification hymn tells us the hero of the story, who scholar Morton Smith identified as the teacher of righteousness, is one among many humans who have been reckoned with the gods or angels. Again, reckoned means made equal to. Therefore, there must have been multiple copies of the celestial robe or more likely, it was a state of being attained by they who knew its secrets, the Essenes. As Peter Schaefer notes in his book, Origins of Jewish Mysticism, in certain respects, the speaker of this hymn represents the members of the earthly community in heaven and shares with them his elevated status during their joint worship. In other words, the speaker transmits the vibration of heaven to the Essenes on earth. A key point about the Essenes is that they claimed attainment of the light body was a return to our original state of being. Whether we realize or acknowledge it or not, Western civilization, our culture, is based on the Judeo-Christian premise that the actions of Adam and Eve, the first humans, are responsible for our current spiritual malaise. This was wholeheartedly believed by the Essenes. Our timeline begins in Eden and ends with the book of Revelation and the appearance of Christ, who leads a mass ascension to, or reunification with, a celestial realm, the kingdom of heaven, that completely transforms earth and introduces a time when all live with righteous values and hence have expanded spiritual capabilities, including the ability to manifest the light body. Further, the Essenes believed Adam and Eve had shining bodies of light and that our goal was to reclaim these bodies and the state of being that goes with it. 
As the Zohar, a later Jewish text says, when Adam dwelt in Eden, he was clothed in the celestial garment, which is the garment of heavenly light, light of that light which was used in the Garden of Eden. In my view, what this means is that when humans lived in Eden, they, we, were in a different form. We had perfect bodies of light, which were symbolized by a robe of light. Our soul lived in a high realm or plane of consciousness of pure light and pure love at one with all that is. Then, as the book of Genesis says, we disobeyed God's orders and ate the fruit, later identified as an apple by the Greeks, guarded by the serpent. After this encounter, we were evicted from Eden. Yahweh placed a gate at the east of Eden with a flaming sword at its center and flanked it with two cherubim. Then, the Old Testament God did something that many Christians have forgotten about, but which affects all. That is, God made garments of skins for Adam and his wife and clothed them. These were not animal skins, as some profess. Esoteric Jewish tradition maintains Adam and Eve's garments of skin were human skin that covered our original light bodies. As a result, our souls fell into physical manifestation or the matrix of Maya. We began to experience reality through the ego, our lower nature. We realized we were naked and imperfect. Both of these terms mean we are no longer in our original light body or wearing our robes of light, but rather are now in human bodies. Jewish tradition says that Adam and Eve's original garment was transported to heaven, where it is now in the treasury of the heavens. The Zohar affirms this saying, at first they had coats of light, which procured them in the service of the highest of the high, for the celestial angels used to come to enjoy that light. After their sins, they had only coats of skin, good for the body, but not for the soul. And something we must keep in mind is that the Essenes did not invent the idea of the robe of light or the light body. The oldest version of stories referring to the robe of light come from Mesopotamian religion, as do some of the oldest creation tales. A garment called the Malamu was worn by the Masmas priests and was known for its whiteness, light, beauty, and force. It made him awesome and radiant, giving him a supernatural sheen. He was charismatic, like the gods. The Essenes wore bright white robes of linen as the symbol of the divine presence triggered by baptism and as a remembrance of the Eden time robe of light. This is exactly the same as the Malamu. It is also the garb of the celestial beings. This is why ascension or attainment of our original light body is symbolized by this white robe. The key thing to remember is that this light body or its teaching or frequency was transmittable. For example, in the story of Elijah's ascension, we learned that as he was being translated into his light body form and transported to heaven via a celestial chariot, the chariot of the gods, he transmitted his robe of righteousness to his priest, Elisha. To the Essenes, Elijah was a person, but also was a state of being. They had eight stages in the evolution of perfect purity and the attainment of the spiritual powers of Elijah. Purity of baptism, purity from animal desire, spiritual purity, the purity of a meek and gentle spirit, the purity of holiness, the purity by which the body became a temple of the Holy Spirit, the purity which gave the power of healing the sick and of raising the dead. And then they attained the mystic state of Elias or Elijah. On earth, this robe or the state of being it symbolized enabled Elijah to perform these miracles, to heal the sick and to raise the dead and to ascend. His acquisition of this glorious body and luminous garment, which was passed down from Adam to Enoch to Elijah, signals his transition from an earthly being to a holy one or a celestial being. And as they say, in order to enter the heavenly realms, we must be dressed appropriately in the robe of light. The Jewish people believed that one day, Elijah would return and would be the herald of the Messiah. 
Later, Jesus identified Elijah reincarnated as John the Baptist, the Essene master initiator whose incarnation was announced by the Archangel Gabriel to John's father, Zechariah, a temple high priest. In Christian art, John reattained the robe of light, possibly having it given to him by an angel, and then transferred it to his cousin Jesus at the baptism, who demonstrated what I call the light body effect at his transfiguration when he morphed into light. From this investigation, the Essenes emerge as these sort of superheroes for ascension. They know that these incredible teachings that they have received from the angels about the light body, about our true nature, about our true history, will serve them, but ultimately they have a vision. They have a vision for a new humanity, a humanity that will live on a planet whose base frequency or vibration is love, light, and righteousness. And they know that while they may not have fulfilled it in their lifetime, that in some future time, perhaps even today, humanity will be able to remember its true nature and ascend to the heavens with the angels.